Chris, welcome to Creator Talks. Have you always lived in Australia? Yes, born and raised. Interesting. The reason why I say that is when I looked you up on Skype, I found you and it had you in South Korea. Oh, yeah. I went to South Korea on holiday and I used Skype to stay in touch with people. Okay. <laughs> well, we've cleared that up. You, sir, are a rising Australian comic scene star and you've won several awards. Has it changed you at all? Are you leaving buildings using the freight elevator? I'm not famous. I'm not a famous person at all. I am just one of a few people that makes comic books in Melbourne. Tell me about living in Melbourne. Born and raised there. Yeah. No, I grew up here. It's a lovely city. It's really nice. I tend to go overseas and some of the nicer cities I visit are kind of worse versions of Melbourne. But at the same time, it's maybe not like Australia isn't maybe as exciting as other countries, or at least doesn't have as big a cultural things happening. Well, like if I were to go there, and someday I hope I can travel there, and I've never been there. I've talked to guests from there. I've had uh, Christian Carnouche on the show. I've had Ryan K. Lindsay on the show. Talked to some folks down under, but I've never been there. And if I were to go there, and I wanted to really check things out, and I don't like doing touristy things. I like doing things that are more like what everybody else does, to really get the feel of the culture and the people the kind of places they go to, the restaurants, the places they hang out. If I were to go there, from your own experience, what would you say, Chris, this would be a great place to go? Melbourne has like lots and lots and lots of amazing restaurants, bars, and cafes. I mean, the cliche is the coffee is better than everywhere else. The city is really lovely. Um, we have great galleries, great cinemas. Melbourne is a really, really lovely place to live. And if you wanted to have a nice, relaxing time, I think it would be a good holiday. So it's not the hustle, bustle, bright lights, big city. It's more of a relaxing, nice area to vacation. Yeah, I suppose. Of the American cities I've been to, it reminds me of some parts of Chicago. Nice food, plenty of culture, but maybe it's a bit quieter. To be honest, I don't remember so well. I hadn't heard about the coffee being better than any place else. Oh, I think just in general, Australians and people in Melbourne are very picky and pretentious about coffee. <laughs> I don't drink it anymore because I think it's better not to have caffeine in me just personally. Like when I went to America, I stopped drinking coffee because it was really bad. Oh. And then when I came back to Australia, the caffeine was out of my system, so I just didn't have to drink it. I see. That's interesting because I know depending on where you get your coffee and out here where I live, it can be mild or very, very strong. And I was a heavy coffee drinker and... In fact, I talked to a previous guest about this very topic. I said, you know, I started weaning myself off of caffeine because it was just making me too jittery and too hyper. And it really kind of frantic. I get like really wound up and very intense when I drink a lot of coffee. So I've been getting myself off of it. So I have very little caffeine anymore. Now it's the total amount of real regular coffees, like a cup. And then I even cut it out of my sodas, like no caffeine sodas. So um, I'm more mellow now. I see why you would do that. Once you get out of your system, keep it out of it. <laughs> Yeah, pretty much just gives me panic attacks now. It's like stepping on the gas. You drink that, yeah. Let's talk about the comic biz. Why did you decide to get serious about making comics? I say making comics. You do make graphic novels, but as far as being a storyteller, which is what you do, you write and illustrate your stories. When was it you decided to become serious about being a storyteller? I went to art school, so I did like contemporary art school after high school. So uh, you guys call it college. Uh, we call it uni. So I went to uni for three years and I did an undergraduate. And I did like a lot of illustration and some contemporary art, but I just kept making comics and kept coming back to comics. So sort of around halfway through second year, I think I just sort of gave up trying to do any sort of contemporary art or, or illustration. That's just not what I cared about. It didn't have narrative. I'm always skeptical of it and I found it difficult to engage with because it's, maybe it's just not for me. But I guess I've been working hard. That's how I think of it in my head. Like I've been working lots and writing lots and trying to sort of up the amount of pages and the amount of work that I can do each day, probably since third year uni. So what that's like, since I was 20, I just sort of format my life so that I have as much time to work on comics as I possibly can, because that's what tends to make me happy. Who was a teacher or a mentor to you that really helped you along your way that gave you some good advice as you were working at university? Well, as much as all the people who were at uni were very lovely, they didn't really know much about comics. I sort of went out of my way to try and be involved in the local comic scene and meet people through that in Melbourne, in Australia, even though we're kind of small comics-wise compared to other places, I think it's very rich. So I met people like Pat Grant, Sam Warman. I think those were the two people whose comics were really amazing, who I really admired when I was like 19. And after uni finished, I was part of this thing called the Comics Art Workshop, which was really good, informative and encouraging. So it was like a 
two week intensive workshop where we went away to sort of like a deserted island just workshop the comics that we've been working on long form graphic novels that we've been working on that whole group of people probably the most formative or the most pivotal mentor experience i've had so that workshop was like a retreat in a way where you're cut off from everything else for a while so you can just focus on your work yes it was organized by Pat Grant. I guess Pat, I definitely see Pat Grant as some sort of mentor. I definitely admire Pat like a lot. So him and Elizabeth McFarlane organized it. And it was going to a deserted island down the bottom of Australia. We flew to Tasmania, which is a tiny island off the bottom. And then we caught a ferry, which is going to another island called Moriah, which is an even smaller island. And then, yeah, we just spent two weeks on what was like a national park that used to be a prison colony, workshopping each other's work each day. So you'd read like two manuscripts a night and then you'd spend like three hours in the morning and three hours in the, the afternoon discussing and workshopping them with everybody else there. That's an amazing place to go. That's very isolated. It must yeah. be pretty quiet, like being in the national park like that and in the evening being able to look up in the sky and see a lot of stars and everything. Yeah, it was lovely. It was definitely isolating, freezing and great. They still have those retreats? So it's run by Pat and Liz, organized mm -hmm. three of them two years apart and they were each on a different island that was their pitch they sort of committed to doing three so there was one on Mara Island just off to Tasmania one in Indonesia um, in Jogjakarta and one up in Sydney on an island called Danga Island. Outside of the people you went to school with on retreat with in your groups who else supported your decision or how did the people around you in your life your family your friends who weren't artists how did they feel about launching a career in art? My family's always been very supportive. I think a lot of friends that I went through high school with or friends I made in university probably aren't really very interested in comics because not many people are, or at least not many people read them regularly, fixated and obsessed. They probably care about my comics because they care about me. So they read them and are supportive in that sense. I never had anything other than support from my parents. Of course, they don't necessarily understand comics they're just like oh this is the thing that he likes doing and he's not destitute yeah that's uh same for me nobody really understands why i like comics or why i do this but hey it seems to make him happy and <laughs> he's still able to work and have a job so fine yeah now your early work if i understand this correctly your first graphic novel was bottled in 2017 that was the title of it bottled it's an exploration of fame friendship and public image and the darkness that lies just below the surface. Tell me about Bottled. Bottled, I think I started writing when I was 19 and I finished when I was about 21. So I sort of wrote it in the second half of art school. And because I was doing uni and had assignments, and I had lots of little short comic pieces that I was trying to do to get better at making them. I didn't feel ready to or have the time to commit to a long form project. Mm -hmm. When I finished art school, I started it. So I spent two years just illustrating it. In terms of what the story is about, it's about that weird period between high school finishing and the rest of your life where you're sort of just in this weird stasis. And for me, university was sort of like, I don't know, you're at risk of becoming very directionless. Like you kind of have to almost arbitrarily pick a point to head towards. But more than that, I think it was mostly about friendships deteriorating. Sorry, my cat's banging at the door. I might have to let it. <laughs> If you hear any squeaking, that's just bad magnolia. No problem. There you go, magnolia. So friendships deteriorating. You get to a certain point in your life where, I don't know, you look back for the first time and decide if you actually think you're a good person or you're a piece of shit. So sort of mm -hmm. come into that crossroad a little bit. So is a lot of this drawn from your own life experience, being at that point in your life, is this how you found some direction was by becoming a storyteller? No, I probably wouldn't put it like that. I definitely bottled, started as an autobio piece because a lot of my earlier stuff that's actually not available because I don't like it at all, really. Okay. started as autobio just because that's a really easy entry point for comics. Mm -hmm. You can sort of just jump straight in. So for this long form piece, I started with something autobiographical and then I just revised it and revised it until anything that was autobio in it had been replaced. Sort of that idea of the thing, like if you have a machine and you replace all the parts, is it still the same machine? So I wanted to have a, a starting point that I was familiar with and felt sort of safe in pursuing a long-form project and then slowly through revisions remove all those elements with hopefully other ideas that have come out through the drafting process and doing that you won the ledger prize for bottle tell me what is a ledger prize it is a i guess an australian comics award run by 
which I don't know who's run by, but it's meant to be a celebration of different and new comics coming out every year in Australia. It used to be run quite a long time ago and was recently sort of like rebooted sort of around the early 2010s. Those that have read the book, what kind of feedback did they give you about the book? People say nice things. <laughs> I don't particularly enjoy talking about my work or receiving praise or whatever, so I try not to engage in that too much. I'm sort of of the opinion that by the time I get to the end of a project, like I already know everything that's wrong with it because I spent like years writing it and particularly drawing it. Like you have to, you write, well, I for bottled, I wrote a script. And then for two years, I would just go into the studio space that I had and just draw. I have to reread the script over and over and over again. You get very sick of it and you can sort of see holes or you can see, you know, things you would rather have done differently or what you want to do for your next project. That forms very quickly and easily in your head. Well, you probably see flaws that other people will not see or mistakes that you feel you would have done differently. Most people, they're not that close to it. They won't see it. They won't notice it. So have some consolation in that. But another book of yours, Deep Breaths, in 2019, which was actually a collection of 10 stories about tension, violence, monsters, and moments. And you had one story in there, Moreland Mates, Another award winner, Lord Mayer's Creative Writing Prize from Moreland Mates. Tell me what that short story was about. It was a fictitious retelling of a support group for middle-aged men who were divorced and didn't know what to do with themselves. Fictitious Moreland Council, like a local government. I originally did it for VoiceWorks, which is a, a magazine that supports people under 25 in Australia. So it's largely government funded. And if you're under 25, you're invited to participate. And you can be paid for, for the work that you get approved. Um, and all the staff is under 25 as well. So I originally did it for that. And then the Lord Mayor's Prize or whatever came up. It was lucky enough to win, which was nice. And what is the Lord Mayor's Prize? Well, the Lord Mayor himself turned out to be kind of a huge piece of shit. But the Lord Mayor's Prize is just one of many creative writing prizes that Melbourne Victoria has because that's something the city prides itself on, being very literary and having a lot of stuff open. There's like a lot of different variations. So the Lord Mayor's Prize has what? Nonfiction, fiction, poem, and then comic graphic novel as well. And I need to mind for the comic graphic novel. And the idea is if you win one of the smaller ones, you go into the running to win um, the grand prize or whatever. And not to take the eye off your success with winning this award, but who was this Lord Mayor that was uh, a bad person? He was the mayor of Melbourne for a long time, and he croaked people and made people uncomfortable. So a piece of shit. You wrote all the stories in the book, Deep Breaths? Oh, yeah. As a personal policy, I don't illustrate other people's work. And over how many years did you work on that particular collection? Is that over several different years you came up with those stories and then eventually put them all together? Yes. So... When I first started making comics, I made a point and made an effort to sort of self-publish and put stuff out and go to zine fairs, because I think that's the only way to keep motivated is to engage with the local community around you. And just throughout doing that, I had like lots and lots of shorts that were sort of like an individual stable pamphlet, so little comics probably covers like seven, eight years of work. Yeah, I'd say that's about right. You have coming up Under Earth. And that's coming out through Top Shelf. This is a big one. This is a 560-page graphic novel, full color, I believe. And it's a story about a subterranean landfill prison. And there's actually two stories going on between the cover. We have a new inmate adjusting and two women trying to escape the prison to enact revenge. I thought it was interesting that you set this not just in a prison, but a subterranean landfill. Why a landfill? I'm not sure I have a better answer other than I thought it would be fun and cool to set something in a hollowed out landfill. The story itself has sort of themes of ecological disaster and all very quickly arriving impending doom. But in terms of the story's inception, I was just like, that would be fun and cool, gross and filled with junk. Like, I think it just sounded fun. After Bottled, I wanted to do something more genre based, more overtly trying to entertain people. More violent as well. I wanted to have like action sequences and set pieces and violence. This is big, 560 pages. This must have taken you a few years to put together. Yeah, because what I do is I write my next project while I'm illustrating my current one. So they do overlap. In terms of drawing the final art, it only took like a year and a half. But I'd already had something I did for Under Earth was, like I mentioned before, Bottle. I started with the script Under Earth. I 
would make notes in like a, a journal or, or just on some blank A4 paper. And then I would go straight to thumbnails. So the idea was because I wanted to make something more fluid and entertaining and sort of that would suck you in. I wanted it to be led by like images and sequences as opposed to dialogue, pictures leading words instead of words leading pictures. So I started out by just doing detailed thumbnail drafts and I sort of was finishing those reiterations and rewrites on those as I was sort of wrapping up the process of doing the final revisions of bottled and sending it off and all that stuff. So there's some overlap there. But I, I think if you wanted to tally it all up, it was probably like, yeah, three or four years. I'm very, very, very glad to have it done. That overlap of your work, that must keep it fresh and from being bedrudgery. You know, having divvied up your work in that way that you're kind of wrapping one up while you're starting the other versus just start to finish. It kind of keeps things moving along. Yeah, primarily the idea is what we were talking about before about having to spend time just staring at this thing you're doing for ages and ages and ages. And my experience is by the end of it, I don't want to fucking look at it. I'm sick of it. I hate it. And if I combined that with having to write it as I went, I just know that I would get stuck in this sort of infinite loop of revisions, reading a page and be like, oh, I fucking hate this because I can't see it properly. I don't have any more perspective. I'm too close. And then just getting stuck, like revising, revising, revising into nothing or into blandness or whatever. So that's why I have that sort of approach of never starting something unless it's properly finished, like unless the story's really very thoroughly mapped out or ideally completely written, and then also writing the next thing while I'm drawing the current thing. With Under Earth, I mentioned a couple of the things that were happening in the story. What else should I know and people who might be interested in this particular story know about it before signing up? Well, you mentioned full color. Maybe I'll describe what the book looks like. So it's spot colors. So um, Bottled had a red spot color. Something I want to do with this one is as you mentioned before, it's two alternating stories. So it's two stories running parallel in the same setting in the same world. One story has a purple spot color and the other one has a yellow spot color. As these stories start to intercut and the characters start to meet each other at two key points in the book, the chapters start to merge and they have sort of a mix between the yellow and the purple spot color. So if you pick it up, you'll notice it's sort of like a yellow chapter, purple chapter, and then as it goes on, it starts to get more and more mixed. My intention was, like, I want to make comic books that you, my, the favorite ones, my favorite comics that I own, that if I pick them up from my bookshelf and I sort of just flick through, I'll sort of start reading them, and then I'll, like, sort of come to, like, 10 minutes later, and I realize, oh, I've read 15 pages or whatever, 20 pages, just because it, like, sucks you in. Like, my aim is to make, with Under Earth particularly, make comics that are really easy to get lost in and really easy to just sort of read, essentially. So even though it's, what, 560 pages, something, it's got lots and lots of pages, even though it's quite long, it should function as a really fluid read. That is my hope and intention, at least. Now, the books that you have on your shelf that you like to read through, the comics that you like to read through, that's what you're aspiring to do with your stories is making them fluid, enjoyable to read. You know, even though it's a long read, it goes by very quickly and fluidly, I should say, not so much quickly. What are some of those books on your shelf that you've read that have inspired you to be a storyteller? I think probably early on, my favorite artist was Dave McKean. Particularly Cages, I think, is my favorite. I'm not so into his painted work, which is still fantastic, but not my favorite. I really love his pen and ink stuff. Have you read Cages? I haven't read Cages. It's great. Definitely worth checking out. I think what's the most successful thing about it is the way that he illustrates and sequences out dialogue, the panel-to-panel -panel interactions, sorry, the panel-to-panel -panel changes um, of the way body language and the way the characters articulate themselves and the way the image perfectly matches the word matches the dialogue. It's, it's phenomenal. I can't see anybody else that does it like that. Ever since I was a kid, I read a lot of manga for my love of Akira is one I was particularly looking at in terms of action sequences. Otomo is so amazing at having these really dynamic images where you can feel the impact. And it looks like you're looking at this moment in time that perfectly encapsulates sort of the person being hit in the face or something exploding or whatever. That's something that I tend to not find in American comics or find them lacking probably because of the page limitations. You know, you can only have so many pages for the commercial Marvel DC stuff. I don't know. I mean, I can list some stuff on my bookshelf here that I really love, but I think would be the main two that were the primary influence or Under Earth. Okay, well, I've written down Cages so I can check that out. I have not heard of that, and it sounds like I would be interested in something like that. It's another one that's like, you know, like a brick of a comic. Uh -huh. Like, it's very, very big. Now, when you do your work, you do the art portion of it, you draw in pencil or nibbed pen, 
and then you color digitally. Do you prefer to always do your penciling with a pencil or a pen, not digitally? You don't want to do your line work digitally? Well, it sort of changed from project to project. So for Under Earth, I did the thumbnails digitally, just with like a shitty Wacom, whatever you call the ones that don't have a screen. They're just like a little mouse pad that you draw on with a, a stylus. I did all the thumbnails for Under Earth digitally so that I could easily rearrange them because like I said before, I was going straight to thumbnails, which means that you have to do lots of revisions, which is why it's on a grid so I can easily rearrange everything. And then what I did was I printed those out and the thumbnails that were like maybe had decent composition or were a little bit more detailed, I would use them as a basic pencil outline. But then from that point onwards, basically I went through pencils and then inks. Then I scanned, cleaned up and did all the digital fills because I would just connect the lines on the piece of paper and then fill them with the bucket tool in Photoshop to save time. And then I went through and I did the spot color. For my next couple of projects, I'm looking to experiment with the digital stuff. I have an iPad and I've been trying to learn how to how to use Procreate and, and all that stuff. But there is a learning curve. It doesn't quite feel natural. I don't quite feel like I have the same handle I have over it as I do with the analog stuff. As usual, you've already started your next project. Well, this one, Under Earth, is wrapped up, but you're currently working on one or two right now? Yeah, because Under Earth took so long, I ended up writing several. So I have a few that I'm just finishing writing before I commit to drawing them. And I have a shorter one. I was really looking forward to doing a shorter project. So I am doing or working on a horror comic at the moment. So, so that's what I'm after. Like I'm trying to see if I can do the what the American serialized 20 pages per chapter thing, you know, just as an experiment. That'll be interesting having that limitation set and you'll have to set the pacing in such a way that you have your chapter breaks in 20 pages because with the graphic novels you're doing, it's up to you how far you want to go, where you want breaks to be. You're not restricted in any way, so this will be interesting for you. Yeah, I'm hoping it'll be a fun sandbox to play. And You know, you create limitations and you can experiment within those and hopefully learn and improve. Is that something you would ever want to do? Is a, a regular 20-page comic on a, say, a monthly basis, or are you much happier doing things the way you are now with a graphic novel or a short story and kind of mixing up the formats and the lengths the way you like to, or when do you feel you need to change? I don't think I would ever want to personally illustrate a 20-page per month thing, and definitely I'd never want to illustrate somebody else's 20-page per month thing. But... I have been thinking recently about trying to do writing in that, that sort of area. Like in terms of a practical approach, the only way I can really increase my output is by writing things that other people illustrate. I just can't draw anymore. I just can't draw any faster than I already am. I can't work any harder, really. I just kind of use all the hours I have already. And it seems like that commercial area is the only place where you can have somebody be properly paid or at least paid a living wage to illustrate something that somebody else writes. But I don't have any solid thoughts about that yet. That's just more fantasizing or wondering. If you were to write something for someone else to illustrate being an illustrator, would you provide thumbnail sketches like you do now for your own work or would you just leave it up to them? Yeah, I have a strong opinion about that actually. So much more work goes into illustrating than writing. And you can see it particularly in a lot of commercial superhero comics really. And so I think a writer should really provide detailed page breakdowns as well as a library of visual images, of reference images. Like you say, oh, you want them to draw a factory, you should send them a folder with 10 factory photos so they don't have to do all that research themselves because they're already having to illustrate everything. Also saves a lot of revision going back and forth. Like, oh, no, I meant this, I meant that, you know. Yes, I can imagine. We've reached the portion of the show where we kick back with the creator and ask you fun questions, Chris, just about yourself, to learn about you as a person. Nothing difficult. So uh, my first question, what do you like to do for recreation? Lockdown has been a very strange time where for the first time in a long time, I've been forced to not do anything. So I guess I just watch TV and read books and zone out and then, of course, socialize with friends. So not particularly exciting. Let's think back to a favorite birthday of yours. What was special about it? And why was it a favorite, if not memorable birthday for you? I don't tell people when my birthday is. <laughs> so I just get dinner with my family, really. I, yeah, I have a thing about I don't like people knowing when my birthday is, which is just something I do or have. I get that. Like, I don't want people at work to know, even though they have it on file and they usually do something 
for anyone at work that has a birthday. I just don't want the fuss. <laughs> you know, I just, just don't want to be in the yes. spotlight for that, you know. That's exactly it. Back when you were a teenager, say 12 to 14 years of age, what posters and or pictures did you have on your bedroom wall? Oh, that's a good one. I used to have lots and lots and lots of movie posters. I used to get that magazine, Empire. I'm not sure if that's just an Australian one or if it's overseas. But they used to like have a poster in them, like a movie poster, an old movie poster. So my whole bedroom was like plastered in these sort of like A3 movie posters. And I hadn't seen half of them. And I just thought they mostly looked cool. But in the end, it sort of worked out as being like a watch list, ticking off all these sort of canon movies that I should eventually get around to doing. And I eventually watched them all. Do you have a watch list? Is there something? I mean, I actually do have a watch list myself of what I have watched and what I want to watch that I keep on my phone. Do you have a list you keep? Yeah, I use Letterboxd. Do you use that? No. Yeah. It's like IMDb for pretentious people. So I just started using it. I just started basically keeping a film diary where I sort of write and rank the movies that I watch as I watch them. Because of questions like these, really, where people are like, oh, what's your favorite movie? Or what's the last movie you watched? And, like, I'd love film so much, but I always just fucking blank and never remember. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so, yeah, I keep a watch list and I keep a film diary. Yeah, that might be a good thing for me to do because I went on a noir binge a couple of years ago and I still watch them. And I still have a whole bunch on DVDs that I have yet to get to. And I have the title and year it was made on my phone, but I'm like, okay, who was in it? Because I've, I've seen so many now. Like, I need to put like a little description. Like, oh yeah, yeah, that's the one with. You know, <laughs> just I've just seen so many. Yeah, I recommend Letterbox. It's really great. I think it's a New Zealand company. Now, a hypothetical situation: you're stuck on a deserted island, only one book with you, a book just for pleasure, or something you're interested in reading, not about survival. So, if you had that time on an island, what would be the one book you want to have with you for pleasure? Maybe if you ask me, like, just for today, I'm sure it would change. Uh, I really love Miyazaki's Nausicaa. I mean, it's like 14 books. Is that allowed to have, like... Oh, if they're related, yes. Yes. Okay, yeah. Then Miyazaki's Nausicaa, because it's so long and it's so beautiful. And also, it took him 10 years to... Maybe longer than 10 years. It took him a long, long time to illustrate. So it's really interesting watching somebody's style sort of change over and over as they're sort of animating and becoming incredibly famous and well-known and, and revered. So that would be my choice. Another hypothetical. If Top Shelf were to make an action figure of you, what would be your accessory? I don't know. Probably my mobile phone, just because I'm addicted to it. And it would not be a, a happy accessory. Maybe a happy accessory would be like a pen or a pencil or something drawing-related. Now, in the real world, what is your favorite beverage? Tea? Beer? One of those two. One of those two. Any particular kind of... You don't have to go mentioning brands, of course, unless you want to. No one's paying for it. <laughs> Is there a particular kind of beer that you like? Uh, no, just cheap beer. That's okay. the one that I buy. <laughs> okay. Cold, cold beer. <laughs> yes. Okay. Now, we talked about books. We talked about movies. Was there a book that you read or a movie that you saw that changed the way you think? It had a real impression on you. Yeah. There's been a lot. I probably watched more films than any other medium i think woman in the dunes was an amazing amazing film that really had a big effect i know it's one of those films that you walk out of being like fuck i can't do that i really wish i could do something that was as good as that and it gives you sort of something to aim for a point to try and improve to and especially because i really like the themes and the way the story progresses and I would really, yeah, recommend that movie. It's amazing. And what was the name again? Woman in the Dunes. It's a Japanese film. I had not heard of that one. Okay. And what is it about you people don't know that you want them to know? I would get this question in corporate settings and it'd be, tell people something they don't know about you. And I'm like, but I don't want them to know anything else, you know? But if, if there's something you wanted them to know, you wanted something out there about you, about your work, about the kind of person you are, what should they know? I often look very grumpy at zine fairs because I guess I probably got up early and I had to drag myself there. But I'm not actually grumpy. I think I'm somebody who looks a little bit more unimpressed or irritated than they actually are. If I look like an asshole, I'm probably just a little sleepy. That would, that would probably <laughs> be my thing. I understand because I look angry if I'm not smiling. It's like, what's wrong? I'm like, nothing. What? What is it? I, I'm thinking. I'm just. I'm just thinking. I, okay, look, I'm smiling now. <laughs> so I have to put on the happy face. Otherwise, I look like I'm frowning, but I'm not. I had an English teacher like that in high school. 
and he says, look, this is just my face, okay? I look like I'm not too happy, but this is the way it hangs on my face. This is it, okay? <laughs> so I'm fine. <laughs> so I was like, oh, okay. All right, well, that's how I feel. <laughs> well, Chris, it's been a pleasure having you on. And the title of the book is Under Earth, coming out through Top Shelf. And by the way, in uh, the previous catalog, that is listed as Certified Cool. So you had a nice big uh, page there in the catalog. That was nice. I saw that, yeah. Well done, sir. And that's coming in October. Folks can still get their orders in now for this lovely spot-colored, full-size graphic novel, 560 pages. Order now. Chris, thanks so much for being on Creator Talks. Thank you for having me. It's been lovely.